A Religion of Self-Realization Devotion to Truth and Peace To settle myself neatly into just one of the world's established religions would be to ignore the guidance of my own spirit. I have found it much more potent and effective to assimilate knowledge based on its resonance with spiritual truth than to limit my consciousness with the unnecessary complexities of the common thinking. My religion, if I am to name it that, is simply my devotion to realize the ultimate truth and to live accordingly, to live in harmony with the highest law, the law of love. I believe this is the true meaning of awakening, remembering the truth as we revive our original estate of purified consciousness. I believe this awakening has been occurring and continues to occur in evolutionary phases, bringing us nearer to what we call Christ consciousness or Krishna consciousness or the I am consciousness. I also believe that the established re religions, which resonate with the hearts of the masses, each contain within themselves an esoteric universal memorial to the forgotten truth of who we are. These churches serve as sacred holding grounds that facilitate the inner evolution of mankind, however slow the pace of the pilgrimage may be. Once we get to the gates of self-realization and recognize the keys in our possession, the guidance from the church alone is no longer adequate. I believe the gates of self-realization represent the point where we do well to develop a personal individualized religion. The many religious practices that we learned from the church have spiritual purposes which are transcendent to the common usage. The rituals of worship, which we applied to some concept of an external deity, can now be implemented with the realization of God's presence within us. The Godhead within is meant to be given supremacy. The Godhead within is the one we must surrender to and devote our minds to. Self-realization is God-realization. Self-realization is knowledge of the eternal presence of God within. Self-realization is the platform of consciousness from which we can heal ourselves, heal each other, and heal the world. Self-realization is like coming out of a spiritual coma. Most of society lives in a spiritual coma with varying degrees of density. Violating higher laws keeps us in a comatose state. Sin and ignorance perpetuate each other. The covering of ignorance or delusions is the comeback for acting out of alignment. Religious scripture warns us against sin because of the consequences of violating the laws of God. The consequence of using the human imagination and creative faculties and life force to serve evil is a resulting reality of evil. Evil really just means ignorance, as in ignorance of truth. Ignorance is often, or I'm sorry, evil is often associated with darkness because there is a lack of light, a lack of spiritual light or consciousness. Evil acts are the acts of people in a spiritual coma who are not evil in and of themselves. They know not what they do. In the stupor of a spiritual amnesia, one lacks the sense to recognize that he is chasing a false light and contaminating his own life experience with false impressions. People live out of harmony with the truth and they do not sense it. People live without a conscious awareness of the true original purpose to human life. 
An ordinary person may sincerely strive to be obedient to the laws of his state and his church, but if he is not self-realized, he will inevitably violate the higher laws and incur the comeback or karma. This law of retribution is an attempt to show one a mirror of his error. The sins we inevitably commit include violations such as withholding forgiveness, holding a grudge, gossiping or speaking maliciously about others, worrying, using our minds to imagine fearful situations, complaining, lamenting, cheating someone out of laziness, cheating someone because it is commonplace, lying and manipulating people, clinging to our anger, clinging to our guilt, dwelling in the pit of self-pity. These are all considered sins because they are choices that go against life. The sin is in the usage of our human intelligence to consent to a discordance in our energy, and the karmic result is the created manifestation of the disharmony in our objective circumstances, as well as in our darkened subjective impressions. Continual sinning is, in effect, a choice to live in a projection or a personal movie based on delusions and diminished consciousness. Jesus Christ's teachings can easily be considered a manual for discovering the purpose of life through self-realization or God-realization. Using a variety of parables, he tells the universal story of living in harmony with the truth by devoting oneself to the higher laws of the Father. By Jesus' self-realized state of consciousness, he knew with total and complete belief the truth of himself and the truth of the manifested world. Jesus was a demonstration of one who stays fixed on the platform of absolute faith and trust in the sublime. He could speak the word of healing and declare it to be done, and by his pure consciousness, he knew the healing to be received, and it was so, it was manifest. Jesus' parables hold gently the hand of our imaginations and walk us toward the understanding of these divine realities. He was conveying to his disciples the occluded significance of the interior realm of life, our intentions, the private thoughts and attitudes, the sins within the mind which fools presume matter not. Jesus warned us to stop judging others, to stop criticizing our brother while we had a beam stuck in our own eye. Jesus commented on the ways the people foolishly imitate the priests, behaving self-righteously while violating the laws of God. He spoke of the false pride that deludes people into condemning others, shaming others out of ignorance. Jesus spoke of the dogmatic observances, which were sinfully given priority over obedience to the law of love. Altogether, Jesus Christ was a demonstration of the original pure state of consciousness. His peaceful, faith-filled consciousness is the state of awareness which sees, knows, and lives by the truth. The Christ consciousness is the mind purified of conditioning, purified of false illusions, purified of fear, purified of doubt, purified of false or unworthy attachments. The Christ is the supreme personality of Godhead spoken of in the Bhagavad Gita. It is the I am. It is the eternal, original self. Whatever you wish to call it, restoring it is the purpose of this life. Our lives are divinely arranged to bring us the opportunities for awakening and remembering. 
as we awaken, we begin to recognize the kingdom of heaven. We begin to live a new experience, a new identity which is transcendent to our worldly designations. In this new experience, there is a profound liberation from the bondage of our former attachments and delusions. All fears are illusions. Fears are imagination containers. They contain us inside a limited state of consciousness. As we awaken from these illusions, we realize that we are free, free to feel the resonance of truth, the resonance of harmony, the peace of the presence of God. I believe that this awakened state of inner peace must be deeply experienced in order to sufficiently entice the conditioned mind to give up its grip on the false narrative of reality. The marvel, the drama, the sensuality, the sentimentality of the mainstream narrative all make it quite difficult to detach from. And yet, once one experiences even a glimpse of their own purified consciousness, and realizes with felt experience the eternal presence of God. Then one knows the nectar of truth and no longer has a taste for artifice and substitutions. This experience is enough to make one gladly devote one's life entirely to cultivating and keeping a Christ conscious garden within himself. All else in life becomes secondary Everything else in life becomes an extension, if not a joyful playground, of the spiritual choice to live in harmony with the law of love. To my awareness, there are no successful communities of Christ-conscious or self-realized people. Perhaps the Eastern ashrams have had better luck with maintaining the integrity of their particular enlightenment methods due to the long-established reverence for spirituality within their culture. But to my awareness of organized religion in the West, once a religion, philosophy, or teaching takes on a form, a name, a building, it tends to take on the nature and quality of its attendance and accordingly loses much of the potency of the teachings upon which it was founded. Groups, churches, and spiritual communities serve best those who are drawn to the path but who seek the truth without. They seek their answers in form, in the external, in relationships and reflections. I think that the souls who grasp self-realization do not join churches unless they are called to a leadership role. I think self-realized people are aware that self-directedness is their mainstay and that groups, although undeniably supportive to the collective pilgrimage, Groups tend to dilute or even pollute the higher virtues of religious teachings. This is the case because of every organization's necessity to be broadly palatable and inoffensive. This is just how it is. Churches and organizations become diluted schools of thought because they dutifully cater to the minds of ordinary people, minds which are often quite attached to various false understandings. It is justifiable, justifiable in the sense that organizations serve the masses. The mercy of the church is in its acknowledgement that if people cannot receive the message, if they are blocked off for whatever reason from understanding and feeling the message, then it will be as meaningless noise to them. The conditioned mind will make noise out of the sagest wisdom if it is not digestible to their thinking. This is why the sages tell us stories. The prophets and sages hold the hand of our imagination and lead us into new fields where we can be a witness to a tale, a vicarious experience, where we can form our own impressions, feel our own internal responses, feel our resonance with the esoteric tones within the stories. Parables are a high art the multi-tiered communication, the patience and poise to speak indirectly, to tiptoe toward an unfamiliar truth, and to an audience of critics, skeptics, and heretic killers. It is indeed a brave mission, preaching the truth. 
As self-restorers, we do well to be aware of our inner state. Life is arranged to reveal to us everything that needs enlightenment. We do well to recognize when we are challenged, when the moment is calling upon us to diligently, faithfully direct our consciousness in order that we face some obstacle within ourselves and take the opportunity to strengthen our faith and conviction. We recognize that such a challenge is taking place when we notice that our thoughts are tenaciously negative, foreboding, or hypercritical. Or we may notice that we are tense, breathing shallow breaths, feeling nervous, or just feeling discontent and unable to be at peace. I believe anxiety is the result of fear-based thinking patterns that have yet to be brought into wholesomeness. They say if you can feel it, you can heal it. Feeling the discomfort of our inner obstacles to truth is actually a gift. It's an opportunity. Unexpected distress can be the outstretched hand of the guiding spirit inviting us to resolve an old mistake. Upon noticing a diminished inner state, we can take the actions that bring us back to center, bring us back to peace and neutrality, and we can consciously reassess the scene using our higher state of consciousness. We can view everything from an elevated platform, including memories as needed. Usually, if we are feeling disturbed, it is due to some disharmonic or negative energy in the mind. Fearful or critical voices can subtly narrate whatever we are giving our attention to, and these negative voices activate our emotions with a toxic energy. By elevating our state of consciousness, we can recognize the falsehood of thoughts. By getting into a neutral state, we can recover our will, our volition, our individual agency to choose to repent from the delusional movie projection. We bring the movie to a halt and shift our attention with a faith-oriented feeling meditation. We shift our energy when we do feeling meditations. It is by restoring truth to our conscious awareness that we heal the discordance in our minds, bodies, and energetic field. By truth, I mean faith and love. These words best describe the essences to which I am referring. Being words, they are just forms, and being forms, they are diluted. Nonetheless, the words faith and love point to the essence that heals and restores the truth to our awareness. This practice of mastering one's own mind to cooperate harmoniously with the realized eternal truth is the process of purification. By this religion of self-realization, we are decontaminating our minds from all the falsehoods and conditioning that block out the light of our own redemption. We are detaching ourselves from the beliefs which were formed in various states of consciousness driven by our lower natures. We are detaching from our ignorance, our prejudice, our blindness. We are returning our minds ritually and religiously to the truth of the peace of God. As we practice our return to Godhead, we discover one by one all the things that inhibit our chosen trajectory. We discover all the ways we are mentally and emotionally entangled with untrue thinking and with disharmonic habits and desires. In mainstream society, these delusions, degradations, and distractions are all accepted as commonplace. Wherever we encounter within ourselves a resistance to love, a blockage to the law, there is our task, unblocking it. Whenever we find it impossible to imagine something from the neutrality of transcendent God consciousness, we have revealed within ourselves a remnant of false understanding. We have revealed within our minds a false but persistent attachment to something. The illusion can be quite powerful if we have been practicing our belief in it 
and acting in adherence to it. Our task is to uncover the false belief and then to correct it, to heal it, to make it whole by shining the light of truth on it. Our duty is to practice these recognitions until it becomes a self-sustaining experience. Mental practice is the process. Faith-oriented feeling meditation is the secret. We self-heal by using our choice and volition to switch out all the programs that block out the light. We restore the purity of our consciousness by calibrating our attention, our feelings, and our imagination to wholesome faith-filled affirmations of truth. Faith without works is dead. We bring life into our faith by adhering to it with our choices, our actions, our thinking, and our words. Our faith is in the law of love. So we choose with love, we think with love, we speak with love. When in doubt, ask what would the Christ consciousness do? If the good choice seems difficult or beyond your capacity, take this recognition as a mercy because this is a sign of needing to get right with yourself about something. Your judgment is likely clouded if you find yourself unable to forgive someone's trespass or if you are compelled to dwell in self-pity. We adhere to our faith most effectively by adopting a sacred practice of regular attunement. Every morning we ought to be plugging into the source. Beginning this activity requires reverence. One has to recognize the merit of attunement practice and use his willpower to carry it out earnestly. Adjusting into the routine can feel tedious or futile but devotion and persistence are abundantly rewarded. The temple becomes purified and the presence of God is realized. The lamp is oiled. It is from this state of consciousness that we are destined to live and by it to restore harmony within and without. As our minds are purified and disentangled, our energy shifts, our character brightens and warms. Our experience is one of pleasure, with poise and confidence, hope and inspiration. Our imaginations become more and more liberated from the bondage of illusions like fear, helplessness and illness. We are free to imagine and envision and thus create a life of happiness and divine expressions. Only the purified mind can adhere itself to the purified truth. Meditations, prayers, and affirmations can help us get situated on the platform of truth consciousness. And because this is a learning field, we are to proceed with our arranged duties within the world, within the game of life. Only as devotees of self-realization, we are to go about our worldly affairs with the goal or challenge of remaining fixed on our platform. This means remaining equipoised in all seasons and in all circumstances, remaining steadfast in our internal balance, no matter what the scenery of the environment. The temptations we face are all the emotional upsets that pull us into a lower state of consciousness. In a way, we are habituated or even addicted to giving in to our own particular brand of false imaginings, delusions of entitlement, delusions of worthlessness. These are part of the game. While it's obvious that such delusions are unhealthy and even destructive, it is less obvious when we are immersed in them ourselves and do not recognize it. The practice of staying fixed on the spiritual platform of consciousness is the game. We are practicing a singular aim in our life principles. We are practicing spiritually mindful living. We are facing the obstacles within our own minds through the medium of our manifested experiences. All we are really doing is getting back to our hearts, as Gangaji said. 
we are returning to living in harmony with the laws inscribed upon our hearts. And with the return to harmony, we are reviving our capacity to direct our lives creatively, guided by the presence of our spirit. We are renewing our power to create the life we desire from our highest. The more honest we can be with ourselves in this practice, and the more we can compassionately behold our own unhealthy entanglements and false impressions, then the more compassion and understanding we can give to other people, and the more easily we can forgive the mistakes of other people. We start to realize that we are all really doing about the best we can with where we are at. What does it mean when we know what is right and yet still choose the wrong thing? What is this addiction to what is ultimately a nightmare existence? Why do we turn away from the light of truth, faith, and love in favor of imagining some unwanted experience? Why do we chase trouble and then wail in the bed we've made about what others have done to us? As if we are oblivious to our choices and contributions as if we do not recall consenting to use our imagination to play a role, to play a game of sorts. We practice mental control to establish sovereignty over our inner kingdom. We practice mental control in order to make sure that our creative faculties are not being misappropriated by false concepts. False concepts like racism, False concepts that come from identifying only as the physical body or the social persona. False cultural concepts that normalize lifestyles which are in violation of higher laws, such as the normalization of materialistic excess and the objectification and exploitation of living beings. False concepts that keep the mass of society in a dimmed state of consciousness thereby keeping people easy to manipulate using an engineered cultural narrative. These false concepts contaminate the mind with disharmony, keeping people disturbed and in conflict. The creative faculties of the mass of society are misappropriated into the service of a limited bubble of human life. Their imaginations are filled with negative suggestions and fearful expectations their minds are conditioned with consistent programming of the news, media, advertising, and they are attached to things like social designations and politics with childish sentimentality. When we are born into this kind of environment and surrounded by mostly comatose souls who blindly follow their conditioning, it is difficult to wake up. It is difficult to conceive of a God-conscious society and a God-conscious existence unless we feel the truth alive within our own heart, as if recalling a lost memory, a sense of remembering home, undeniable as the truth, the truth of something hidden, something that must be realized for oneself. In this way, spiritual awakening gradually becomes more private, and one begins more often meeting with God in the most secret place, the inner temple, rather than in the gathering of the church. We can best apply our creative faculties to being the change we wish to see when we have sovereignty over our own minds. The reason we can know the right thing and yet still do the wrong thing is that our energy is scattered, our aims are many rather than singular and focused. I believe that we do have to remove ourselves, at least for a period of time, from the psychic influences of other people in order to cleanly reconnect our minds to our own intuition and feelings. However we wish to live our life, however we wish to grow or improve, however we wish to experience this existence, if we fail to develop a mastery of our own mind using a discipline that roots itself infallibly in the law of love, our best wishes and intentions can get contaminated and our life force misappropriated due to the illusory nature of material reality. Self-realization or Christ consciousness is the spiritual destiny of mankind 
and as it is a devotion to the supreme truth, it is the one faith worth religiously observing.